to embrace the principles of God's Word about how to do your relationships. And we've talked about some of those big uh, areas of conflict that we know every family struggles with. We've talked about commitment and intimacy and parenting and money. And so this weekend, you decided what we were going to talk about. Uh, You guys gave us questions, and we took those questions, and we grouped them into categories. And uh, we're going to try and answer those questions today, talk about those subjects that you chose uh, this morning. Now, let me introduce the panel, just so you know who everybody is. Uh, Chet Anderson is our executive pastor here at Calvary. And uh, he loves it when you applaud. Uh, (laughs) Chad Merle is our family pastor. He's also known as the OC. <laughs> Julie Garnis is our children's minister. Hello. Oh, yeah. Of course, right. her mom is sitting in the audience. <laughs> hey, it wasn't house. just my mom. I'm the lead pastor here. Right. I'm Chad Garrison. <laughs> and, uh, our, uh, Woo-hoo! Uh, <laughs> and our... Uh, moderator who's going to try to keep this group in line and on task and most importantly on time is our that. student pastor Robert Smith. So Robert yeah. take it away. Well, over the last four weeks as, as Chad shared we've been working through uh, these topics of marriage and family uh, and parenting and these things and, and throughout this we've tried to be intentional to show how how each of these things applies to someone who even isn't married or is dating or, or looking forward to that and so we're so glad to get a question uh, from someone sent in in that same area uh, from someone looking ahead towards marriage the question is how do you know that you will be happily married one day and that your spouse will love you with your flaws I heard somebody chuckle already. (laughs) Because you don't know. You don't know you'll be happily married. Um, You can make some choices and listen to God's word to help make it happen. In the Bible, it says in 2 Corinthians that you should be equally yoked, which means don't um, be yoked with an unbeliever. So that can help set your relationship relationship straight. Um, Also, be yourself right away. Don't hide anything. Be yourself. Um, take it or leave it. You know what I mean? Um, when I think of if, if your spouse will love you for your flaws or not, I think about when I was dating Brandon, who is my husband. He saw my toes, and they look mm. like snossages a little bit. <laughs> Do you guys know what snossages are? They're the dog treat. <laughs> anyway, um, and... He, went, he saw my toes, and he told, he told me all the time he loved my toes. And that, to me, was a green flag. Like, this guy is, yeah, that's it. <laughs> he loves me for who I am. We're golden. <laughs> Not that that was like we're going to have a happy marriage, but it's a good, it's a good flag to look for. I, I think also the w- Word of God gives us a very clear picture of what love looks like and what a marriage is supposed to look like, what, a, what the roles of a husband, what the roles of a wife should be. And I think that we've let go of that a little bit. I think if we were to go to 1 Corinthians 13 and Ephesians 5 and all the other passages that talk about marriage and what a marriage should look like, uh, that's the groundwork. That's the foundation for building a good marriage. It's not a guarantee that we're going to have a successful marriage, but without uh, loving the way 1 Corinthians 13 says to love, we're not going to have a shot at it. Uh, So follow what God's directives are in God's word. Um, and that's going to give you that first step towards having a successful marriage. He can't Absolutely. bless what he doesn't say to do. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, anyone who's married uh, knows that a source of tension and conflict can be in-laws. Oh, um, yeah. And so... <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah. We know that. So uh, in that, we, our next question has to do with, with that balance in those relationships. And that's how do you deal with in-laws if they don't like you or they don't respect your boundaries or decisions? Awkward. Yeah, take that one, please. (laughs) (laughs) One word. Homicide. (laughs) It's not biblical. (laughs) It's a solution, but we're going to offer you a biblical solution. Thou shalt not murder. So don't walk out of here going, (laughs) Jet gave me permission to shoot my in-laws. That's not (laughs) what I said. Don't say that. Biblical is that you choose when at all possible and up to you to live at peace with everyone. You're making a conscious decision to communicate 
with your in-laws. This is a new household that God has put together. Here's what we've decided as husband and wife and children in that household. Here's what we would like for you to do to help respect us so that we can respect you as far as boundaries are concerned. I think one of the real keys in that is truly respecting your in-laws and modeling that for them so that they hopefully will listen to God and respect a godly marriage that you are choosing to model for them. I would add also, first off, my in-laws arrived in town last night, so pray for me this week. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> they, were, they were here last service. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I spoke very highly of them in last service. Um, you did. <laughs> yeah, he said he's going to love you them to death. <laughs> yeah, he says he loves them to death. <laughs> Literally. No. Uh, but one thing I would say about in-laws, um, the first aspect of marriage, and I've already touched on this a little bit, is your spouse is your primary relationship. Genesis tells us that a husband and wife will come together, they will leave their father and mother and cleave to each other. Before you got married, your primary influencer was your parent uh, or parents. And when you get married, you now push them to the second role, and your spouse takes that first priority as being the influencer with you. And so you have to recognize and help your in-laws recognize that this relationship between my wife or my husband and I, this is the first relationship that takes priority. The second thing to understand in this is that, guys, conflict's gonna happen. Absolutely. If we recognize that we are people, we are humans, every relationship that we get in is gonna have a level of conflict. But if we recognize ahead of time, I'm gonna get in conflict with my in-laws probably, but the response to that conflict is how I choose to live. So I'm going to respond in a godly way to that conflict. I'm going to respond with gentleness, with respect, with a godly, Christ-like behavior rather than letting my emotions take over and sabotage uh, my relationship with my in-laws. Yeah. Well, I, I happen to know that uh, Chet had a, a really powerfully emotional kind of conflict with his uh, mother-in-law when he and Claudia, uh, early in their marriage, because they were expecting their first child, their first daughter, uh, Caitlin, and she didn't like the name you picked out. You want to talk about that? Yeah. Uh, Ruby, my mother-in-law, decided that she, we should name our child a particular name that she picked out. And we decided, as a family, <laughs> Claudia, Chet, James, and Michael, on the name Caitlin. And we tried to communicate that to Ruby, but Ruby was having nothing to do with that. Matter of fact, got really angry with the fact that we didn't name the child the name that she had picked out for that child and actually stopped communicating with us because of that fact. The baby, I think Caitlin was about six weeks old, and, uh, and her, her sister pulled her aside and said, tell me about the grandbaby. Well, she couldn't tell her anything about the grandbaby because she'd never seen Caitlin, and in that case, the aunt, Claudia's aunt, Ruby's sister, said, look, do you ever want to see your grandchildren? And of course, what grandparent doesn't want to see their grandchildren, right? And she said, do you think that Chet loves your, your daughter? Well, well, sure. You think he loves your two grandsons? Well, sure. Do you think he loves Caitlin that they brought into this world? Absolutely. Do you ever want to see them together? Well, of course I do. Then you need to accept the decision that they made as a family of what to name their child. She spoke into their life for them. And at that point, we got over that hurdle. She forgave me. I'm not sure she ever really liked me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> she did. She, lo she loved me. Well, at least she said she did. <laughs> hey, the, the, the powerful point is, is this. Uh, all of us have um, crazy relatives, yep. right? Yeah. I mean, yep. you're not the crazy relative, but you have crazy relatives. Right. And <laughs> if your family is like all the rest of ours, there's conflict in your family. Be that person who speaks peace and reconciliation mm -hmm. into those family conflicts. Don't be the one that fans the flames of conflict. Be the one who, who says, hey, you know what? Do the right thing and reconcile for the big picture so you can bless those kids. That's yeah. true. Mm -hmm. That's Amen. good. So here uh, at Calvary, and just a few seconds ago, OC shared that your spouse is your first priority. But we also say that, that family comes first 
And in that, we also say that God is our first priority. And so some, sometimes there's a tension there on that balance. And a question came in, what does family first mean? How do I put God first and still love my family? You know, I use that, that phrase all the time, especially with our, our ministry staff. We talk about family first. So, uh, you know, family is the very first responsibility that God gave us in creation. And, and so uh, we are to love our family, take care of our family, protect our family, provide for our family. They're, they're our first ministry that God gives us. And, and in fact, uh, how you take care of your family is a qualification for being in spiritual leadership. And, and so we take that really seriously. But I understand the tension how some people go, well, I love my family and God gave them to me first, but I'm supposed to love God. Because Jesus said, if you don't love me more than you love your father and your mother, your husband and wife, even your kids, then you're not worthy of me. And in fact, one of the Gospels, he contrasted it with hate. If you don't love me compared to hating them. And, and so that creates a tension in us because we kind of go, well, I, I, I got to love God, but I got to love my family. And some of us feel like we have to take love away from our family to put it toward God. But that's not how it works. Uh, here's how it works. If you love your family the best that you can, uh, you're going to love them uh, okay. But if you love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, then what God does is he amplifies your love toward your family. He doesn't take love away from your family. He multiplies love for your family so that you can love your husband and wife better, so you can love your kids better. Uh, and, and so family first means that you, you love God with all that you have so that he can help you to love your, your family the way that you need to love them. So here's the question on whether you're loving your family more than you love God. Are you leading your family to follow Jesus? Or is church just something that your family does together? Well, I'll break the silence on that one. Um, <laughs> I want to speak into this a little bit because it was an issue that I had. You know, you question, how can I love God more than my family and still, like, keep it in balance and all that kind of stuff? Well, Brandon and I decided we, we are going to put God first. We love him more. We really do, and we want this to trickle down to our children. We want them to know, and we want them to see it. Um, the, the trick is, is if you tell your kids, if you tell your family, God comes first. I love him so much. I love him more than anything. And then you come home after a long day of work, and you're a complete jerk face to your family. You're telling them something totally different by your actions. Actions speak so much louder than words. Um, also, a few months ago, I was putting my little seven-year-old boy, Sawyer, to bed, and he said, Mommy, I need to ask you something. I said, yes, what is it? He said, is it okay if I love God more than I love you? And I was like, yes, it is, and then I wanted to go cry my face off. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Oh, that's but beautiful. I love that he can see that and understand, and it's so important for us to strive with our actions as well. That's great. Here at Calvary, we're, we're pretty pr transparent with our struggles, and uh, a few of the questions that we had come in were very uh, personal with some struggles that these couples were dealing with. And the first one in that area says, my spouse has wandering eyes. How do we address this as a couple, and how does the Bible address this? Guys? I'll take this one, <laughs> but I need to get up. Uh-oh. Okay. <laughs> you should be scared. Yeah, I am. This is how you deal with wandering eyes. You throat punch. <laughs> and done. Okay. <laughs> you, so. you guys pray for our staff. We have violence <laughs> issues. We definitely no, have some fine. violent tendencies going on upstage today. I know. It's effective, though. And I'm, <laughs> effective. I'm sitting between the two of you, though. And... You should be scared. <laughs> yeah. Very All right. Good. So I really don't mean that. It just when you're angry, that's actually what you want to do, right? This isn't just an issue for guys. It is for girls, but most of the time it's guys' problems. So let's talk about that, my perspective. Um, so <laughs> Ecclesiastes 6.9 says, Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the appetite. Mm -hmm. That is so powerful. Guys, girls, if we keep our eyes focused on the one that is ours, the one that God gave us as a gift, that is so powerful in a relationship. And Brandon and I have grown a lot, um, especially since I started coming to this church because I figured out, oh, we can be open about our issues, like talk about them, and God can redeem them. Something that Brandon and I struggled with at the very beginning of our marriage, and it still can be a battle today, is wandering eyes. 
Um, it was something that cut me pretty deep when I saw him look, checking out other girls, and I did want to throw a punch. But instead, we went to a marriage conference, and we were encouraged, <laughs> but the better choice. It's the better choice, yes. Yeah. <laughs> we were encouraged to read books. They were called uh, Every Man's Battle and Every Woman's Battle. And while I was reading that book, I started to understand the struggle of some men, and I actually threw up in my mouth just a few times, because you guys are sick! <laughs> Glad you found that out. <laughs> And it's not to excuse the behavior, but to understand the temptation that they face. And something that really helped us out was it, was, it, it wasn't his battle anymore. It was our battle together. And um, we had the conversations of, Brandon, when you look at other chicks, it makes me feel like a piece of junk. And he understood and he listened to me and he acted on it. And still to this day, he will change the channel if a Victoria's Secret commercial comes on. <laughs> Amen. Not because I'm going to throat punch him, but because he loves me. Yeah. Hey, let me, let me tackle this from the, from the guy side uh, a little bit. Uh, because as a, as a follower of Christ who's been in ministry a long time, I, I've spent my, my life, uh, adult life, trying not to look. Okay, just that's my thing. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to guard my eyes. And, and yet, Morelda and I will be out, and she will go, Chad, Chad, look at that. Look at that. <laughs> I don't think God gave her those. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I'm trying not to look. And you're telling me to look. Don't, uh, you know. So, um, you know, ladies, if you're doing that to your husband, understand he is in a battle, so don't encourage that. Uh, you know, on a little bit more serious note, uh, Scripture tells us if we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, he'll help us overcome those sins that so easily entangle us. And so the more we fix our eyes on Jesus, the more we love him, the more we can follow him. And guys, the more you fix your eyes on your wife and not other women, the more you'll love her and, and the depth of that relationship will grow. Ladies, on the flip side, uh, please be modest. Uh, I'm just going to confess, for all of us men, we notice cleavage. We notice hemlines. <laughs> Okay, thanks for that confirmation. We're uh, just but, being uh, honest here. Yeah. And we're not hiding that fact. We, so, so if you are dressing because you want guys to check you out, repent. Okay? Yeah, one, one of the things also, Claudia and I were having this conversation about this question, and one of the things is, because of most of us deal with body issues, body image issues, we, we hear a compliment and we immediately dismiss it, especially with a compliment like I look at Claudia and I tell her she is the most beautiful woman in the world. And that's the truth. I truly mean that. But she may deflect. You may hear that from your spouse, spouses, wives. You may tell your husband, he is the most handsome man in the world. Oh, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. What you're really saying to them is that they should not value your opinion. They should not value what you just told them. You're just saying something to be nice instead of being realistic. So can I encourage you to be able to learn how to accept a compliment, especially from your spouse? Because that will help those eyes and those areas that you may choose to wonder in and to stop wondering. We know that uh, everyone has a, a different pace as they go through their journey of following Christ and as they travel down that. And we know that that's true in marriages as well. And our next question is, how does one spouse lead the other deeper in faith? What do you do if one spouse is uninterested in growing or is an unbeliever? Okay, so I'll take this one. Uh, the first thing that we need to understand, if we've got a spouse who is not spiritually where we're at, or they're not excited about their faith, or they don't have a faith in Christ at all, the first thing to understand is we cannot control them. Guys, you can't change your spouse's heart. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. The job of us is to influence. The job for us is to influence our spouse and show them the love of Christ. And so even though we can't control them, we can be that primary influencer by the things we say, uh, the things we do, the decisions we make, the responses that we have to our spouse, and that will reflect. 1 Corinthians 7 tells us, Paul teaches us that if you've got a spouse who doesn't believe, your actions may lead them to Christ. And so in everything you do and say and respond to your spouse, keep in mind that your spouse 
may or may not see Christ in the way you say things or do things. And so be that light of Christ in your spouse's life so that they may go, you know what, they've got something and I want it. And they may spur them to talk to you or come to church with you and explore what Christ has for them uh, in their own life. The other side of that is uh, as you live your life day in and day out, your spouse, without shoving it down their throat, needs to understand that you are a better husband or wife because of your relationship with Christ. You can forgive and you can show grace and mercy because of Christ, not because of your own strength. But your relationship makes your relationship with Christ makes you a better spouse, and that may draw them to Christ as well. Yeah, many of you have been in a, a long journey of just walking, praying for, and modeling. The word that I really have for you is don't grow weary of doing good. You know, in a gentle, humble manner, model, as the OC said, the life of Jesus Christ in your home. It may not be accepted right away, but as you do that over and over and over and over, first of all, God's growing your relationship with him. Second of all, you're allowing the Holy Spirit then to enter into your home and to change the hearts, the mind, and the focus of your spouse, not you. Don't be demanding. Be gentle and caring as you model it in your home. Yeah, amen. That's good. Our next question is, um, what do I do if I'm unhappy or bored in my marriage? How do I keep my marriage interesting from the living room to the bedroom? Ooh, I'll take that. Uh, <laughs> now I'll take it because, uh, you know, the world cheapens what marriage means. Uh, and the world will tell you that marriage is supposed to make you happy or keep you entertained. And that's not God's plan for a relationship. You know, God's purpose of marriage is for us to share our life with someone. Uh, to love them, to serve them, to grow with them in intimacy and care, to partner together in raising kids, take care of each other. And out of those actions of commitment, joy and peace and satisfaction will grow. And, and that's just, that just uh, applies to all of us. Now, on the, on the boredom issue, relationships become boring when we stop investing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When we stop mm -hmm. communicating and talking and dreaming and planning and growing, then they become boring. They become boring uh, all the places. And, and, they, and they ask about the bedroom specifically. So let me just say this. Um, as a married couple, you, you are free before God to do whatever it is that both of you agree to do. Okay, you have freedom in Christ uh, with the boundaries being God's commands, uh, which means that you can't uh, invite another person in to the bedroom and you can't have any animals. Yeah. Okay. Bad idea. Oh. Bad idea. Hey, look, I, I, you know, I know that um. some of you are going, why did you mention that? Because we live in a sick and twisted world. And, <laughs> and because the Bible mentions it. And, uh, and I just got to say this. I really think in the next 10 years, because marriage is so messed up in our society, that somebody is going to sue the courts and say, I want to marry my cat. <laughs> there, he's, he's perfect for me. So... Uh, now, yeah, well, it's just going to happen because that's, that's what sin does. It just keeps going to ridiculous levels. <laughs> hey, look, on, on the rest of your marriage, if, all of us have the potential to have our marriages get stagnant and stale and get in a rut. And if you find yourself in that place where you don't know what to talk about or how to start a conversation and you're just sitting there going, this is boring, uh, then you have to reinvent your marriage at every stage of life. Yeah. which means that you've got to take the lead. You've got to start a conversation, talk about your kids, talk about your grandkids, talk about the day, talk about your jobs, talk about your dreams. What do you want to do? Where do you want to go on a trip? Plan things together. If you don't know how to do this, then join a life group. Okay. Be around other people who can share life with you and they can coach you on how to be interesting. I don't know. If you're, you know, if you're fun <laughs> challenged, hang out with people who are fun. So, uh, but you've got to invest in the relationship. You can't just coast or it will get boring. Yeah. I'm still laughing because what would that conversation look like in the life group? Hey, you're really boring. Can I help you be interesting? What? <laughs> uh, Chad has that conversation all the time. Right. Because <laughs> he's boring or? No, uh, you oh. figure it out. <laughs> you ask. Anyway. I'm the boring one on staff. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> We've got some serious did you issues. Want to, did you want to add to this? Yeah, I wanted to add to this. Okay. <laughs> that or Robert's got to correct so, us. Yeah, no, I'll reel us in. Okay, I hear a lot, and I don't know if it's because I'm a chick or what and surrounded by drama sometimes, but I hear this. He doesn't make me happy. And I want to go, wah, wah. 
<laughs> because, real, I mean, I can see you, you know, falling into that trap of feeling that way. But you guys, no one has the power to make you happy except for the joy of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Like Mr. Boring, I could be like, hey, be happy. No. <laughs> see, and you wouldn't turn. <laughs> I don't have that power. And it's, saying he doesn't make me happy, it's not about that. It really isn't. It takes work. You find your joy in the Lord, and he helps you make the choices mm. that can make you happy. Yeah. Amen. That's good. Thanks, Julie. Uh, we know, and, and we've seen it all around us, you guys have seen it, that blended families, blended parenting can be a, a huge challenge. And so uh, a question that we really wanted to, to answer this morning uh, was sent in, how do you navigate the minefield of blended families, and parenting. Chet, would you take that for us? Sure. Be glad to. Hey, did you notice the question, how do you navigate minefields? It, it, one is to be acutely aware of what's going on in your household because you can create a dynamic that will blow up in your face if you're not paying attention, if you're not communicating, if you're not really clear on what your expectations are, especially with blended families. Because what you've done is you've brought several different ideas, several different philosophies, several different lifestyles lots of times into one household, and you want everybody to be the same. Well, everybody is not the same. Praise God. We are different. Uniformity is not the goal. Unity and love and purpose, as we talked about earlier. One of the things to look at, I believe, is clearly defined expectations. Here's an example. Claudia's idea of discipline was here. My idea of discipline was way over here. And so we were constantly at odds as I was too harsh, she wasn't harsh enough. What are we looking for? We're looking for effect, right? So we had to talk, we had to share, we had to communicate what our expectations were, what we wanted to see accomplished. And you see what happens? We began pulling closer together in our ideas. We shared those. We verbalized those. We didn't fight and argue about them. We brought them together and we said, what's going to be best for our household? What's going to help our children, our lifestyle the best? And understand, everyone is not going to be the same. Punishment, actions, do not are not always the same for every child or every person in your household. Be willing to adjust. Try it. If it doesn't work, admit, hey, I'm sorry. I apologize. And let's adjust this a little bit if we could. I would also add to say that if you've got a healthy relationship with your spouse, there's a trickle-down effect onto your children. If you and your spouse are living life together and working to have a healthy relationship, your children, as a result, will be blessed. It's not a guarantee that your children are going to be amazing and they're going to follow God forever, but it gives them the first step towards that. Um, if you've got healthy kids and you've been investing in your kids but not in your relationship with your spouse, it doesn't work the other way around. It doesn't bless your marriage. It actually makes it more difficult. And so your spouse needs to be that primary relationship that you're feeding into because that will then bless your children. Mm -hmm. The reverse is true. If you're not blessing your spouse, you're handicapping your children. The other side of that is this. If you've got conflict going on with your children and stepchildren and this and that, it may be time to analyze how you have created that dynamic. Mm -hmm. Was the split that you had with your ex particularly ugly or nasty? Do you talk bad about your ex around your kids? Because if you do, you just taught your kids how to treat your new spouse. Did you catch that? Mm -hmm. If you're talking bad about your ex or the breakup with your ex was nasty, you just taught your kids to treat your new spouse in a nasty way and to hurt them because that's what you did to your ex. And so if you have that relationship where it's totally destroyed with your ex and you've damaged it to the point that you talk bad about them, maybe you need to go to your spouse and seek reconciliation in a way that builds a healthy dynamic there. And you go, well, I can't do that with my ex. Well, at least start talking good about your ex around your kids. Don't downplay them. Don't hurt them. Don't talk bad about them because you're teaching your kids how to treat your new spouse by doing that. And so you need to analyze what you need to do there. 
That's good. As OC talks about forgiving exes and forgiving that previous spouse, uh, our last question is on the topic of forgiveness, and it says, how can I forgive my spouse for breaking the vows in a significant way, such as adultery, abuse, abandonment, or addiction? Uh, you know, forgiveness is something that, that God commands for all of his followers. Uh, the Apostle Paul says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. And, and so we know that we're supposed to forgive, uh, and, and yet what happens when it's a, a really bad hurt? Well, a couple of thoughts. Uh, first of all, God can restore and redeem any relationship where two people are committed to each other and are willing to follow Christ. Because we've seen that happen in this church. So if you're at a place of brokenness, understand that God can redeem. But it takes two people committed to Christ and one another. Um, on the other hand, if your spouse uh, doesn't want to reconcile, doesn't want to redeem the relationship, and they've broken those vows, God blesses divorce. Yeah, did you hear that? God blesses divorce in cases of major vow breaking. Uh, Jesus said, look, when adultery is involved, uh, you don't have to stay if that trust has been shattered. Uh, Paul said when they abandon you and, and they give up and walk away, uh, then, then you're considered free before God. And now, understand, we want God to redeem our relationships. And if you fight for the marriage and God redeems it, the scars are still going to be there. They're going to remind you of the pain, yep. but they're also going to remind you of God's power to heal and to restore, and that's kind of cool. Now, whether the marriage survives or not, forgiveness is, is allowing God's grace to flow through our lives to another person. And, and here's the cool thing. When God's grace flows through our lives, then it cleanses us of our anger and our bitterness and our hatred and our rage. Because when we hold on to unforgiveness, then it's like drinking poison and hoping someone else dies. It's not going to help us at all. See, here's the, here's the big thing. Forgiveness is for us. I, I mean, it's great to receive forgiveness. I mean, I love being forgiven. But here's the thing. When we forgive others, it sets us free. It cleanses our heart and our soul and allows us to experience God's blessing. God tells us to forgive because it will heal our souls and our hearts, whether it's to forgive the spouse that we're going to stay with or forgiveness so that we can be in a healthy relationship down the road. But forgiveness is key. Can I talk about that a little bit? Of course bit? you can. Be We're honest not with ever my... tell you to shut up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> He's just scared because I said I throw punch people. Right. I'm so, scared too. Can I talk about the forgiveness thing? You should be. <laughs> it's, it's so easy to say you need to forgive. It's so easy to say those words, but do we really understand what forgiveness is? I've been searching for a correct way to put this so that we can all, including myself, understand, and this is what I found. You can choose not to let the offense defined, define the relationship or to define your spouse. True. With forgiveness, you stop identifying the person by their rebellion, but by grace. Mm -hmm. We have to almost get God's eyes and look at them through his eyes, not what they did, not with pointed fingers, but with how they see that person, whether that's your spouse, your ex, your kid, whoever you're trying to forgive, it's identifying them through God's eyes, not our own. Mm -hmm. You know, God desires to bless our marriages and our families. And we step into his blessings when we embrace his principles and we live those out in our day-to-day -day lives, in our marriages, in our homes. Uh, and here's the challenge we want to close with today. Do you want God to bless your marriage and your family? Now, if the answer is yes, then I, please know that you can't change anyone else. That's been shared plainly and clearly to, the, today. But God will change you. Because you're the change agent that is surrendering your heart and your life to Christ. And he will change you. In just a moment, I'm going to pray for us. And, and if you want God to change you so that your marriage is better, so that your family is healthier, then, then we're going to ask you to just make that commitment before God. If you're single, whether you've never been married or you're single again, are you willing to say, Jesus, I'm going to live my life and do my relationships in a way that honors you rather than the way the world describes and the world encourages? If so, then today is a day of decision for you to say, I I'm going to do this God's way and I'm going to honor him in all of my choices and all of my actions. Because if we will embrace God's principles, God's way of doing relationships, he will bless us as individuals and as couples, 
and his families. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the gifts of love and life and family. Uh, We know that we fail in so many ways, and we ask today for your help. We ask that you would restore those that are broken. We ask for forgiveness. We ask for the power to be able to forgive those who have hurt us. Father, we pray that you would help us to fix our eyes not only on Jesus and put him first, but that he would help us to love our spouses and our kids in a whole new way. Father, for those that are struggling in blended families, we pray for healing and hope. And for those that are single, we pray that they would feel your pleasure and your joy in their condition as they wait for that day when you may bring someone into their life. God, most of all, thank you for adopting us as sons and daughters of God. We love you, and we are so grateful for your love. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Let's stand and let's worship our God together.